uh, we only have two crossings because that's, <clears throat> excuse me, the, the Department of Transportation directed that we would only have two locations. They're the ones that made the call on that saying that you're only going to have golf carts crossing our highway at these two places and nowhere else. All right, I appreciate that. So that one is not uh, up for discussion. Requirement to wear seat belts. Ms. McPherson, are you suggesting that, because I haven't read all of this, that there is a requirement to have seat belts but no requirement to wear seat belts? Is that what I'm understanding? David, is that? I can't find it. And yet, that was the main reason that former councilman brought it up. It, it was a, a thing that was very important to him. I wasn't a big proponent, but, you know. Uh, I, I don't know the answer to that question. It's a legitimate point to look into. You would think that perhaps the general state law requiring us to wear seat belts in our cars probably would also apply to the personal transportation vehicles, but makes I haven't looked at that. All right, and then, uh, or Ms. McPherson, liability insurance. Does our ordinance require liability insurance, David? Not that I am aware of. You know, quite frankly, if you're out driving on the road without it, you're okay. well. You're I mean, mistaken. Uh, that sort of fits your same logic with yeah. the seatbelt. But I'm hitting right. the points that she brought up. It yes. doesn't, but it does reference that you follow state law in regards to liability insurance. Right. So we may well already be addressing I, I that. I think you're probably covered on if that. If we were. And then the, her final point is how we educate the public. And it sounds to me like she's suggesting that uh, the, the dealers would be involved in some way in educating the public and probably be required uh, to hand out some sort of a pamphlet or some sort of information. Do we do that? Not that I'm aware of. And along with that, just posting a page on our website that says, here's the rules for golf carts in Villarica, which I don't think we have that either. Okay, so Ms. McPherson, if I, and David, feel free to interrupt, but, but if I understand correctly, uh, the only item that remains of any discussion here would be the speed limit. Does that sound right to you after having that discussion? Well, it would except that I also, I don't always agree with necessarily taking no for an answer, especially if it was years ago that they met certain stipulations. So you could be over on Memorial Drive, North Ave, all these places that are 25 miles per hour. But if you wanted to cross Dallas Highway to get over to one of the other 25 mile, even at Tanner, from Tanner, um, you couldn't do that based on if they're only going to give us two, because we have state highways going. That's our challenge in Villarico. We have state highways going through everywhere. And so I don't think it would hurt to revisit it with them and verify, um, you know, what are their requirements? Why are there other options for us? That's pretty, that's pretty I, much I agree it. with that. It doesn't hurt to ask again. I mean, okay. that was the answer last time. We've changed in five years, so. Yes, I think that Mr. Williamson dealt with this maybe in 14 or right 14 yeah. or 15. Okay, yeah. Mr. Carter. Uh, yeah, I'm interested in that. What she said about 35 because everybody south of I-20, a block from coming downtown was a golf cart. Edge Road is 35 miles an hour. Daniel's 35 miles an hour. You just can't get here from there because of the speed limit. It's it locked in here, so I'll be interested in seeing if we can put them on 35, right. particularly which roads we can use. Well, the, the one point to remember on this, and I try and look at it from a practical standpoint, personal transportation vehicle by definition is limited to going no faster than 25 miles per hour. So if you put a 25 mile per hour vehicle on a 35 mile per hour road where most people are probably driving 40, 40 plus you have the poss you have at least the concern i don't want to say that it's going to happen but at least the concern that you have people that get impatient who are driving 40 miles per hour behind somebody who's putting along at 25 miles per hour and they do things like try and pass that's something to at least consider and, and i think y'all have to you, you can legally do it but you've got to use your good judgment as to whether or not it's a good thing or a bad thing to do it Okay. Uh, is anybody else? I just wanted to add um, on the crossings issue because, you know, for example, I live in Summergate, so technically by this per ordinance, which I guess technically Bay Springs Road is not a city road anyway, so there could be some other hiccups in that. But the idea being that you couldn't 
go from Summergate across the street to the V-plex because we're limited to just two crossings. Now, 61 is a four-lane highway in that part, so that may be some other considerations, though it's controlled by a traffic light. So, um, you know, but thinking about the speed limit issue now, I don't, I, I want to say Bay Springs is probably a county road. So as I think through this, maybe my thought process isn't well, there, so but it, still. If there, uh, Mr. Young or Ms. Marchman. Yeah. I, I just want to make one comment. The ordinance says it keeps calling it public roads. And that's not exactly true. It's city roads, not county roads, not state roads. It's, it's city roads. So that there's people get a wrong perception there of, of, you know, every road is public out here unless it's a, a private road or something. So they think they can get out on it just reading, reading the ordinance. And that's not true. I understand that. So it, it sounds to me like there is at least uh, enough of a consensus up here to task staff with taking a look at this question of increasing the speed limit and uh, also these crossings. Uh, so David, this is really going to fall in your wheelhouse with the legal part and then staff will have to work on uh, some sort of a recommendation to bring back to council. And so mm -hmm. I think it, would that, is that what you would like to happen? That would be great. Sorry. That would be great. All right. Yeah. Let's do that. And then we'll come back with some sort of a staff report and see where we're at. My initial thoughts is that uh, along the lines of what you're saying, it, it is going to, it seems to me very difficult to uh, increase uh, the allowable speed limit for these vehicles on roads where you already have people driving substantially above the speed limit. The fewer of these on those roads, the better. But Let's see what staff comes back with, and I appreciate that. Thank you, Mr. If I could just mention real yes, quick. Yes, go ahead. Um, part of what uh, made me think about this is the fact that we want to have a gold nugget trail, but let's be honest, that is years from now, and so it would be nice to have some other options. I just mentioned also David had such a valid point, because you also put that in your email, about what happens a car gets behind. Um, I'm a walker. I'm a cyclist. Bicycle and um, also drive an RV. And there are times, just out of courtesy, what you need to do if there's a faster vehicle behind you is to pull over to the side and let them go by, including when you're going up the mountain with an RV. Nobody wants to get stuck beside. So when there's a place to kind of pull off, just let them go and uh, dealing with impatient people. But that's all. Thank you. I appreciate the consideration and that we can look at it. Thank you, ma'am. Okay, let's move on to A2, the appointment of William D. Coleman, Jr. to the Villarica Development Authority. If there are no objections, I'll make that item consent number one. No objection. Let's move on to B1, 2, and 3. These items, I, let me just say right up front, this is a big agenda, and I intend to move through it as quickly as possible. Uh, so if you see me doing that, don't be surprised. Items B1, 2, and 3, uh, community development. These are alcohol permit requests. Uh, they will require a public hearing on Tuesday. I do not intend to spend a lot of time with them tonight. They will not be on the consent agenda. However, if staff would like to at least present them uh, in case there are questions from staff tonight, I'm happy for that. Who's going to do it? Bobby? Come on. <laughs> Item number B1, ABL-01-2021, alcohol beverage permit request for Me Ranchito, Inc., DBA, uh, El Ranchito, uh, Bobby, go ahead. That was a lot. Mr. Mayor, I think this is a change of ownership via divorce. Um, they currently have an uh, alcoholic beverage license. It's just a matter of a change of ownership and uh, renewing. Thank you, sir. Any questions from council? All right, let's move on to B2ALB-02-2021, alcohol beverage permit for Buckeyes Bistro. Go ahead, Bobby. Mr. Mayor, this is a new uh, bistro restaurant lo located in a suite adjacent to the Chevron station over on Edge Road. Um, this is a new application to pour and serve alcohol, beer and wine. Um, they've <coughs> passed the background check and all the ordinance requirements by the city and staff recommends approval. Okay. Again, there'll be a public hearing on this Tuesday night if there's anyone who chooses to speak for or against this. Mayor, uh, that's tonight. Council. Nothing. That's tonight. Oh, there will be. I'm sorry. <laughs> <laughs> Calm down. Give it's me a okay, moment. Mayor. They're, they're, all the applicants are planning on being here tonight. Thank you, sir. Mm -hmm. All right. Uh, council, anybody have any, uh, any questions on this item? All right. B3, ABL-03-2021, alcohol beverage permit for Thai Basil Cuisine, Inc. Bobby? Mr. Mayor, this is also a new uh, application 
for the Thai basil cuisine restaurant. Um, all uh, restrictions and, and uh, uh, qualifications. The um, the applicant has passed all background checks. Everything is is copacetic with the city and uh, staff recommend approval. All right, that's a new word for you. I haven't heard you use that one before. Where Council, it, any questions? This, Mr. Carter, located? it's in the, the end cap of the uh, Oak Charlie's on the other end. Yes. Any other questions from Council? All right. Thank you, Bobby. Mm -hmm. Uh, items uh, B, 4, 5, and 6 uh, are variance requests requiring a public hearing. Let's go ahead with uh, item B4, VA-05-20, variance request at 739 Parker Street. Go ahead, Ron. Good afternoon, Mayor and Council. <clears throat> uh, the applicant is requesting a variance from the minimum dwelling size permitted in the zoning ordinance, which is 1,500 square feet. Uh, they wish to construct a one-story single-family dwelling uh, with a total heated square footage of 1,152 square feet. Um, so the applicant is requesting this because of the um, averages of the square footage for dwellings along Thomas Dorsey and Parker Street in that general vicinity being uh, substantially lower. So this, it, the section that they're asking uh, relief from is 4.04 in the zoning ordinance. Okay, and like I said, there will be a public hearing later tonight, uh, and the staff recommendation is? Uh, is denial. All right, council, does anybody have any questions for Ron? I told him with my questions. Okay, so no, Mr. Carter? No All right, no questions. Ron, let's move on to B5, VA-02-21, variance request at Southwest Corner at North Dogwood Street and White Street. Go ahead. Yes, the applicant is requesting a variance to remove sidewalks as a requirement as set forth in section 9.014 of the Z Villa Rica Zoning Ordinance. Uh, the applicant received preliminary plat approval from the Planning Commission on December 1st to construct 15 single family homes with back loaded garages and driveways. And this lot is located in the R2 single family urban zone. Uh, Ron, help me out here. I thought I received an email regarding this particular variance request that suggested that since there would be the necessity to remove a certain number of trees, that they would no longer be requesting this variance. Is that not correct? No, they're still requesting uh, the variance. The applicant hasn't given any further information. Um, we received very preliminary uh, information last week um, related to the trees that were subject to the December 1st meeting and that a lot of those trees are going to be removed. So the purpose of this variance has now become unclear, being that they should be able to provide the sidewalks. Bobby, do you have something to add? Mr. Mayor, when the preliminary plan was approved by Planning Commission, um, the grading plan is not included in a preliminary plan. It just shows the layout with a topo and all that. Um, I saw the grading plan in order to, get, to collect the stormwater and get it into the pond in the back. Um, it's going to remove a lot of those big trees that we were trying to save. Um, so that being the case, they'll, they'll have to replace some trees, but those big ones in the front, the grading plan is going to take those out. So the sidewalk is, is needed. Okay. All right. Well, I appreciate the clarification on that. So but the, the bottom line, though, is the staff is still going to recommend a denial of the variance uh, that would allow them to not build the sidewalk. That's correct. I understand. Okay. Council. Thank you, Bobby. Council, does anybody have any questions for Ron? All right. If there are no questions, Ron, we will move on to B6, extension of rezoning approval for Annex-02-19 and RA-06-19 at 135 and 189 Commerce Drive. Go ahead. Yes, um, city staff is requesting um, an extension of the rezoning approval um, for this property. Uh, it expired on November 26th of 2020. Um, the property owner, which is uh, here for the uh, work session, um, is attempting to secure other commitments for that project. COVID may have um, killed the original deal, but they're still looking to move that apartment complex uh, project forward. Um, so they would need an additional extension until January of 2022. Okay, so this is an extension uh, of one year request and this one staff recommends? Yes, we recommend rec approval. Approval, all right, mm -hmm. council, anybody have any questions? 
All right, again, there'll be a public hearing on this, so uh, we will move on. There being no questions from council, let's uh, get to, we're gonna skip seven. However, Madam Clerk, that still needs to come up on the regular agenda. All right, B8, amendment to the Villarica Zoning Ordinance Residential Subdivision Design Guidelines, Chris Montesinos. Go ahead, sir. Uh, good afternoon, Mayor and Council. Uh, this agenda item is a supplement to the zoning ordinance. It's not an amendment to it. Uh, what this does is provides uh, an enhanced resource to guide the review of residential subdivisions that are being proposed within the city limits. Um, it, uh, it, it is a supplement to the design standards in the form of additional guidelines which provide some enhancements that may be considered by the either the city council or the planning commission dependent upon the uh, time of review <clears throat> uh, these are uh, recommended guidelines they are not requirements they go above and beyond what's required from the ordinance standpoint uh, to provide some flexibility to the decision makers when they are looking at um, areas where the developer does not want to abide by guidelines and maybe can act as a supplement, but it's, a, it's an enhancement of the existing standards, not a detraction from those. Give me an example, uh, if you can, Chris, where that might apply. All right, I uh, chose three examples. Um, I'll try to keep this brief. Uh, for example, uh, houses on corner lots, the current ordinance requires that there be no uh, blank windowless walls, leaves it at that. This takes it a step further and says that there should be at least three. Now that depends on the placement, you know, where they can go on the structure, what particular room that is, uh, and how that's gonna lay out. So those are kind of flexibility matters that the planning commission may say, well, we don't really like just one small window on one side that really doesn't meet the, uh, the intent of the ordinance. Uh, another example might be, uh, and we're going we're gonna to actually see some of these examples play out the next couple of months with a development that's moving forward. 50% uh, of the front foundation should be uh, some sort of masonry, whether that's brick or stone or something along those lines. Um, this requirement requires that that front facade uh, trim wrap around all sides. Now that uh, is aesthetically appropriate, but you know, from a cost standpoint, maybe not very practical. But it could be a situation where there is uh, higher visibility for certain houses in the neighborhood that maybe should require some additional fenestration treatment. So that may be an additional requirement that the planning commission could could um, add. Uh, the last one I have is with respect to uh, front entryways. Um, we've seen a number of. Uh, houses being proposed moving forward that have very limited um, architectural fenestration or windows or any sort of decorative uh, designer elements or architectural elements. Uh, this provides a list uh, that, that the Planning Commission could say, uh, you should really look at some of these things like uh, having side, side light windows or uh, additional trimming on the, the, the perimeter of the door or uh, a certain width of the porch or something like that, which is not necessarily a requirement of the ordinance. But what I do like about this one uh, garage wise is that the garages should not take up more than 45% of the front facade. And we've seen a lot of examples where you've got, you know, a small recessed entryway and a two car garage, and that would not be something that would be allowed under this, uh, under these guidelines. Well, so, it sounds to me what you're suggesting is that the PNZ would have the ability to be more restrictive uh, as, uh, than the actual code. But if you are going to do that, why would that not be a staff recommendation as opposed to it being left to the PNZ? And further, uh, if that were to happen at the PNZ level and that were to be the final uh, say, rather than it being some sort of a recommendation up to the, the, the city council, what would be the applicant's remedy if they still felt that that was just too much? Well, what, what would happen is uh, if there was a situation where 
uh, the applicant disagreed with a requirement or a condition that the Planning Commission was going to impose as part of the preliminary plat process and plan review process that is under their uh, umbrella, then they would uh, fall under Section 11.11, uh, .11, which is the uh, administrative variances, which contrary to what that sounds like, it's actually a, a council review of a decision of either a staff <laughs> member or a board uh, in a decision that was made. So there is a right to uh, appeal in those circumstances. Okay. Th that remedy feels like it possibly could resolve my concern that uh, an applicant uh, is, it feels that they have been unfairly uh, treated in that process. However, when I think about the third example you gave, it seems that it could be appropriate to let some of these more mundane decisions fall down to the P and Z level mm -hmm. uh, because there are circumstances where if you were to wrap it around three sides of the house, two sides are never even seen, have no way to be seen. So why would the aesthetics matter in that case? So I can see that. That being, uh, any council members? Mr. Montahan. I think my question right now is what is the hypothetical situation in which these guidelines are employed? It sounds like you're referring to uh, plan pre preliminary plat review, but so how do you foresee this happening? The preliminary plat review is submitted to the PNZ, and then the PNZ then refers to these guidelines, ref you know, looks at the pr the preliminary plat, and then suggests or offers to the developer, well, on lots 10, 12, 13, we those are corner lots, therefore we recommend or suggest that you are in, put some stipulation in place to, you know, additional windows or so forth. Or Is that the scenario? Yes, exactly. Okay. Um, I guess, why not, I guess it's too early to do that at zoning then, right? At the zoning application level. Well, a lot of times at the zoning level, um, you know, prior to the approval of zoning, they don't necessarily have the preliminary plats right. or the building elevations that are being planned for the next step. Right. So. And so if the developer says, no, i rather just keep, I mean, I guess the other part is we're now asking at preliminary plat re 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 um, review to also review architectural standards. And maybe, I mean, the developer is going to have to submit some architectural Elev elevations, reviews. Yeah. Elevations, Correct. right. Uh, I mean, are we... I don't know if I mean I don't know if we we do that now in our current PNZ. I've never seen them review architectural no, elevations. We, we really did not have strong architectural uh, requirements prior to the adoption of the new zoning code, and so this is as a supplement to the the new the the actual standards. Um, this. Um, this is really more of an enhancement from the standpoint of the staff level because the staff is really more involved in reviewing uh, the elevations and reviewing uh, plats and then making a recommendation based on the technical merits with respect to design requirements or, or even some of the guideline mm -hmm. enhancements. Um, so the staff will, be, will have uh, greater clarity in what exactly we're supposed to be looking for. Right. The, I guess if the, if the developer just straight declines to adopt any of those recommendation guidelines, what's what's next? Uh, we've we've got one of those coming down the pipeline, and what's going to happen is that they were they are seeking relief from the requirements of the ordinance standards, mm -hmm. which is which is separate from the guidelines. Uh, in that case, they are going to be filing uh, a special exception under the auspice of a, uh, a variance from the design standards. And okay. it will be incumbent on them to articulate what their level of hardship is in meeting the, the code requirements, uh, other than it's just too expensive. But at the same time, we're casting these as guidelines and not requirements. So what, uh, maybe this is a David question, but what legal footing do we have to enforce them on a on an applicant if they're just guidelines sure uh, the, the standards uh, in the ordinance are very specific and are more um, across the board for all development 
the guidelines are additional enhancements that could make a project better that perhaps the developer didn't really consider. Um, if, you, if you look at the totality of the guidelines versus the, the actual ordinance requirements, uh, it's, just, it's just an expansion upon uh, things to consider, like uh, if you are going to have a trailway system in your neighborhood, it's recommended that it actually connect to a regional trail system if there's one available. Uh, you know, that's not something that's required by code. It's just kind of like, it just makes sense. Uh, there are some other examples with respect to landscaping or most of these are really design related. I think our design standards are pretty solid. They are extremely solid for PUDs, but for just regular single family residential subdivisions, they're not as restrictive. So what we mm -hmm. want to do is these will kind of add some additional considerations that may uh, make a project better. But to your point about the legality of it, um, the standards are the law. Any considerations or conditions that may be considered arbitrary um, do have an appeals process that they can go through. So, right. um, and so if I may borrow Councilman Young's printout here. So the portion here where it says the planning zoning commission shall approve the petition, approve the petition with conditions. I mean, when you say petition, this sounds actually like it would be the, I'm sorry. No, I was just com oh. commenting that now we, we can't enforce the design standards if they tell us to go the guidelines on priority. If, if they just say, no, I'm not doing it, there's nothing we can do other than yeah. they're, they're trying to buy our cooperation to speed the process right. along and, and cooperate with them if they adopt those guidelines, but we can't force them down their throats. And mm -hmm. so it seems like the only remedy we have would be to just deny their preliminary plat route altogether. Yes. I mean, so, that's not the only, that's not the only thing we could do, but that is a strong remedy. Okay, because I mean, I think what I'm getting to is that the PNZ Commission shall approve the petition, approve the petition with conditions. But when you say a petition, what, what are we talking about exactly? Preliminary plat yeah, the submission? It's the application for the preliminary plat or, or conceptual plan. Okay, I just think some of the length, I mean, this sounds like this page 14 and 15, the last couple of pages, I mean, this sounds like an entirely different application and scheme from a preliminary plat submission. Yeah, I think, so, I think the intent of the, sec the last section there is to um, maybe bestow some authority uh, with regard to what the Planning Commission is supposed to be looking at, how the process and procedure works out, and what the, what the, uh, the remedies for appeal would be. I mean, and their authority is already bestowed in the fact that they have prelim plat approval, and we don't review that unless I guess there is an appeal if yep. they deny it or right. something or add conditions. It's just that this doesn't read that way. Yeah, I, I, I went back and looked at that uh, this afternoon and it, it does add a little uh, murkiness mm -hmm. to it. Um, I, I, I'm certainly not, I, I don't think that the last two pages, 14 and 15, are, are critical to the document. Mm -hmm. uh, since it is a guideline and it's not a regulation. So I'm, I'm certainly not opposed to omitting that just for clarity. But to the same respect, it does say very specifically that, um, that the Planning Commission has absolutely no authority to approve any deviations from the ordinance standards themselves. And that is that authority is bestowed only to the City Council. So that pretty much covers everything that's required mm -hmm. except for the additional enhancements or guidelines that are recommended. Okay. Well, if if I were to take David's word, uh, which I always do, uh, it sounds like that those would not be enforceable anyway. Uh, so tell me, tell me how you would be better served by having 14 and 15, or tell me, let's strike it and be done with this. Um, I think just for the point of simplicity, if we strike it and be done with it, since this is just a guideline, the provisions and procedures of the Planning Commission are already articulated in the zoning ordinance, and it's a little repetitive to include those in a supplemental uh, uh, article to the uh, zoning ordinance. Does that satisfy your concern, Mr. Montahan? It does, okay. I think. But I do have one more question. All right, go ahead. Semi-related. I'm sorry. Um, so this is, you said this was a supplement to the zoning ordinance. Correct. Uh, not an amendment. 
And number nine is also, an, is we have it as an amendment. Well, the next three, we have it, eight, nine, and 10, we have it as an amendment. But if we're amending the zoning ordinance, does that require public hearing? Yes. Okay, so. So we these don't. do not indicate public hearings. No, there's it, the amendment to the zoning ordinance. Um, that's a very good question. With respect to the design guidelines, since those are not an amendment, it's more of an adoption of a supplement. And that one specifically would not require a public hearing. Uh, as far as the other Can two Can you get a little go, closer to the mic? Yeah, I'm sorry. Uh, as far as the other two go, um, city attorney. David. Um, yeah, I, I don't have the numbers in front of me, but any time that you amend an ordinance on a zoning ordinance, it requires a public hearing. Okay. And, I, you know, adopting a supplement that is not actually an amendment really, to me, doesn't seem to have any purpose or okay. effect. That satisfies possibly eight. It does not, however, satisfy nine and ten. That's correct. If I have to have a public hearing on this, I haven't advertised that, certainly not on the agenda. Uh, do I need to even entertain these tonight? I would re request they be pulled. Yeah. Uh, well, so eight, I'm going to ask somebody to amend the motion when we get in there. It's not going to be on the consent agenda, but leave it there. Uh, nine and ten, I'm going to ask them, somebody to table these two items to the next council meeting, okay? If somebody will do that, okay? All right. Chris, uh, all right. Thank you. Thank you, Chris. All right, folks, are we clear on that? Uh, number eight, uh, B8, uh, will are be- we clear? Will be modified. Are we clear on somebody making a motion on those? To uh, modify the motion to remove pages 14 and 15, uh, and then on B9 and B10, those are to be tabled to the next council meeting. All right. Um, items B11, 12, 13, 14, 15, and 16 are reappointments. I am going to read these off and then I'm going to ask if there are any objections to placing those on the consent agenda. 17 as well, if I didn't say that. All right. Item B11, appointment of David Rogers to the Historic Preservation Commission. Item B12, appointment of Sarah Pitts to the Historic Preservation Commission. Item B13, appointment of Alan White to Historic Preservation Commission. Item B14, appointment of Renee Hooks to Historic Preservation Commission. Item B15, appointment of Matt Pilgrim to Planning and Zoning Commission. Item B16, appointment of Tom Flowers to Planning and Zoning Commission. And item B17, appointment of John Hannaback to Planning and Zoning Commission. Are there any objections? No, no objections. Sir. Let me point out that the, it specifies the first two it gives them one year, the next two gives them two years, actually next three or two year appointments, 16 to 17 and three year appointments, according to what I read on. Oh, well, okay. I was going to have you uh, uh, complete that as an administrative task. When you put these back in, I want their terms, okay? Okay, that's fine. All right. But I thought you were saying it was on the, 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 the my agenda, but it's not. All right, so will you do that? Are there any objections to placing these items on the consent agenda? No, no objections. All right, thank you. All right, y'all give me just a moment to get caught up. So that's C2 to C8. B. No, consent 2. Okay, to consent gotcha. 8. All right, C2, C3. Okay, I got you. Okay. All right. We replaced uh, C1. Uh, so I'll ask uh, Parks and Recreation and Leisure Services Director Tracy Ivey to come forward. Uh, C1 splash pad equipment purchase. Ms. Ivey. Good afternoon and Happy New Year to everyone. Thank you. Uh, this action is subsequent to your last Friday's action to uh, authorize a contract with a general contractor to, for design build uh, services for the splash pad. And what we've done is met as a team, and we've decided uh, there are several deducts that, we could, that could have been pulled from the contract, and we will purchase some items directly. 
And one of those items is the Vortex equipment, which is all the splash pad features that the kids will play with interactively. Uh, we've decided to purchase those uh, directly through the National Purchasing Partner, uh, which is a national purchasing co-op that gives us uh, competitive pricing and also a little discount for registering. So uh, what we're asking is to purchase uh, that equipment through NPP uh, in the amount of $73,867. And as we know, this is a budgeted item, and this also saves us the sales tax uh, by going this Certainly route. Certainly does. All right. Council, does anybody have any questions for Tracy? I have a question. Yes, ma'am. Um, I did read the email with the information. It doesn't, we don't have it electronically. Is that correct? We still have just the Gratic information? That's what my... Correct. Okay. So I'm going to talk off my head, but I remember most of it. Uh, oh. You have uh, a paper copy there if you need it. I must have one. Okay. Oh, I'm sorry. I, Only I do? I'm not seeing it, but that's okay. Mm -hmm. I think I think I don't think I really need it ultimately. Okay, I'm um, sorry. Would you like? I got the idea about us purchasing directly, saving money, tax. We've done the saving the tax uh, cost on that. It came at the recommendation of the man we hired from Cobb County who's overseen a lot of these projects, correct, to go through these. And so my only thing would be uh, to use this company. Normally, I'm, I'm guessing we would put out to look uh, for competitive bids. So I guess my only thing is to also that we're always transparent that the person that made the recommendation doesn't have some sort of tie-in with the company or anything like that. That's what I'm, that's the only thing I care about right now is since we were directed to go one place for the items that we make sure everything's on the up and up. I don't know any other straightforward way to put that. I, I've known uh, Bob McAllister for a number of years uh, as a you know, colleague in the parks and recreation industry and he is a very upstanding guy in the, in the community. He's retired now, but uh, I, I, don't, I don't believe there's an issue there. So any cost comparisons or we know that buying this equipment through them is not only quality, but it's, it's competitive. Absolutely. And, and, and Vortex is the top of the line equipment too. It's, it's a very sound equipment that will give us years of, of service. Tom, are you, are you comfortable with what we've done on this? I'm de only because you're the city manager, I defer to you oversee all of this. So, I, I don't, I've it's only, not on. I've only known Bob for one project. We did an aquatics facility in my previous job. Uh, I don't have any reason to believe that there's any financial kickback or anything that would concern us about that. But this purchase is the reason that we had the Friday special call meeting so that we could bring this back today because we have been told that there's a 16 week lead on delivery and we're trying to open in the summer. Well, 16 weeks is mid May which is going to make the summer really tough. But if we had lost a month, then we're in mid-June just for delivery. No way we're opening until maybe July. And then, you know, your summer's, you're potentially a couple of weeks from school opening. So anyway, that's, that's how we got into this. And I get that, and I understood that from the email, even though I couldn't be at that meeting, that that was the reason we were trying to get ahead of the game. And I am in no way trying to infer that somebody's not on the up and up. I just want us question. to be very clear when we're only going to one source and that uh, I, I, I don't want to be a part of holding this up, but I do want somebody to just ask that question of him. We just want to make sure that what we're buying is competitive for the quality that we're getting. That's all. Right. Thank you. Yes, yeah, sir. One, one of the reasons that I recommend somebody like Bob in a situation like this is because I know two things are going to happen. One is he is going to keep me from using equipment or vendors that he's had bad experience with. And two, he is going to direct me toward vendors and equipment that he's had good experience with. And he has done this for all of Cobb County for however many years. I can't, I can't duplicate that in house, you know, and I don't know anybody else in the business that I could go to that, that brings that to the 
to the process, right? So what I'm counting on by bringing Bob to the council and y'all approving him is that all of this equipment, whether it's the filter pump room or the play equipment or whatever, and all the contractors that we're using are going to result in a project that we really, really, really like because this is a lot of money to me. When you think about the whole master plan of redoing gold dust, you know, 800 grand or 750 or something is a big, big, big chunk of it. And this is a super visible project. You know, this isn't like the edge road water line that nobody's really going to see. This is something that the whole community potentially is going to interact with at some level with their kids or whatever. So that's, that's why we're doing this the way that we're doing it. All right. Uh, any other questions from council? Um, Mr. Let Parker. me just point out one thing, uh, just so the public will know, the equipment purchase is $74,000 worth of equipment. So don't, I um, want well, they need to be aware that we're spending that kind of money. Okay, Using Mr. a national purchasing co-op gives us some certainty that the lead time is going to be right. No? Wouldn't think no. so. I sure wouldn't want to make that statement if I was in this environment. Right. Well, y'all keep in mind that, that, one, that's how he operates. But, two, <laughs> there are any number of reasons why that he can't make that call because COVID slows down production, it slows down delivery, there, it has impacted industries all across. So there's Material just no way, but we're doing the best we can to be proactive in trying to get ahead of it. And that's what this, this thing's all been about. And if I, if I might yes, as well, uh, the, the, these will be the last features that will be uh, in the installation process to keep from vandalism occurring and that kind of thing. So this is, so we have an even, even more time to hopefully we get all this in in time for that installation process. Well, I hope you also have a plan for where you'll store this. We have security. a plan. We do. We certainly do. It's not at my house. <laughs> all that I know. Okay. Uh, any other questions? All right. If there are no questions, I'll make this uh, consent item nine if there are no objections. All right. Thank you, Tracy. Thank you. Uh, D, Public Works, Bobby Elliott, D1, Avanti, Welcome Center, Plumbing Repairs at Nick. Come on up here, Nick use some colorful language uh, in your cover sheet, and, and if not specifically language, you certainly drew a picture for us. Uh, that was my intention. I got you. Uh, Go ahead. Okay. So uh, actually thinking about this item, we could consider it completely funded. Um, that $3,000 that we're, we're over is coming from maintenance repair buildings. We are maintaining and repairing this building. So, Have you ran that by Sarah? Yes. Do you, would you feel that that is uh, funded? through the budget mm -hmm. okay all right go uh, ahead present the item okay so this item or let me give you a background since I've been here which is almost six years um, we have the welcome center and Main Street office um, has always had kind of a pugnant odor um, when you walk in especially in the mornings it's a sewer smell we know what type of smell it is so that's not questionable um, but there we really haven't been able to rectify that issue we have we can't correct it or nothing that we have done in the past has corrected it, which we've tried many, many, many different things. Um, going as far as sealing and uh, the floor drains, which isn't advisable, but we're going to give it a shot. Um, I've had the the problem that we are running into is there's a venting issue with all of the toilets and the sewer drain, and we really don't know why. Um, the sewer lines and the plumbing is going through the concrete subfloor, but there's also, you know, we've repurposed that bill or that building's been repurposed at least four times in its history. It's, it's very old. Um, we've a portion of that building was demolished when we built the amphitheater. There's been tales and rumors that a sewer line has collapsed somewhere on that property somewhere. Um, the main sewer line is going through the middle of the Avanti building. So I've had multiple contractors come in. None of them have given me the suggestion of just starting new, let's investigate, let's demo the concrete, we'll pull all the tools, pull the vanities, um, and start fresh. But before we start, and what 
you guys need to know is that once we get through this concrete and in the sewer and the drain lines, when we scope them, we may run into something much larger. Um, we know there's an issue. It is, I feel it's unfair to staff for them to have to work in that type of environment. Um, I, I, I do strongly, strongly believe that if we, re, if we vent each tool it connected to, you know, what our, our initial plan is just to, if we don't pr find any problems with the existing venting that's near the roof, we're going to just tie into that, but each fixture is going to have their own vent. We're going to put primer tra uh, trap primers in there, so it's constantly going to get water. Um, because one of the things that does help the issue is pouring water into all these drains, filling the toilets up man manually because something is sucking everything dry. Something is pulling it. Um, so I met with PV Construction. He, and like I said previous, he's the only company that has offered this type of solution or work scope. And I'd like, you know, you guys are aware of that issue, you know, by approving the budget this year and what our intentions were partially, but this is what staff recommends approving. So, Nick, I'm sympathetic to that uh, situation down there. It does concern me, though, that really what you're describing here is almost a fishing expedition. I mean, you don't know what the issue is. Is there no other way to get to the issue? Can we not scope these lines? I'll I have tried. I've had a company come in and try it. We have no drawings of the plumbing like a few other facilities. There's no, no plans, nothing to refer to. Um, so if, say we, we, when I scoped it personally, I went pulled every toilet, scoped it, and I tried creating like a, a schematic, you know, hand-drawn schematic to find an issue. It's where that's fishing right there, you know, um, because I've even gone so far to pull, there's a huge mirror in the men's bathroom at the Avani building. I cut all the drywall off to try to see where the venting is, what could possibly be pulling, where, I know that the issue is there's a vacuum issue. There could be more issues. Um, so as far as finding another solution to possibly doing something on a lesser scale and, and fixing it, I don't think so. I, I, I really don't. Okay, not. well, I wanted you to talk about that because you describe in here how you feel like you have exhausted what the limits of what staff can do, and I wanted to hear you say that because when you describe it as though we're going to spend $34,550 on a remedy that may or may not produce the, the final result that you hope to achieve but may well create a new problem that is discovered that you're going to bring back over here that you know I at least want to know that we've done everything that we yes. can before we go this route all right staff does anybody have I mean <laughs> council does anybody have any questions uh, I didn't see the timeline and how long is this going to take do you think um, the work once we begin well, this exact scope of work should take around two weeks so what the city has arranged with, for the staff is, is for them to go ahead and relocate at the library. That'll give me an additional couple weeks that I can, and what I hope to do, and I may not, I'm, I'm gonna try to do some of the demo work in-house. You know, with them out of that office, I'll have more time to kind of start nicking at these things and preparing, you know, um, which will, if I can actually put a dent in it, would lower the cost. Um, there's also been talk about repurposing the Avanti building. Does this tie in in any way to those plans as, as preparatory work or? Well, no more. We're, it's not just the, you know, we're also getting vanities, new fixtures, new stalls, new flooring. Um, so we're, we're, we're going to fix the issue. I'm confident of that, but we're also going to remodel. Okay. Uh, anybody else? My concerns mirrored yours. It okay. was the, the hope. We hope this does it, and but it looks like you've exhausted. I wish I could guarantee it, I, yeah. but I'm afraid. You know, like I said, that main sewer line is my concern. There could be a better. Well, I mean, you you've been doing this long enough to know. I don't want you to stand up there and and guarantee something and then come back and and ask for more money or ask for something else either. when you didn't get it right the first yeah, time. Yeah, who would want to work in there? All right. Uh, <laughs> if there are no objections, I will make this C10. No objection. All right. Uh, Nick, let's move to D2. Is that you? 
Yeah. Yes, sir. To engage KBS heating and cooling to replace a seven and a half ton a unit located at 70 Harsh Luther Drive. This was an emergency purchase. Yes, is that sir. correct? I'm actually asking for a ratification. Um, the company has installed that unit today. Um, that's the, the building that we lease out to Southeast Trans. Um, they have office staff on, you know, if y'all been in the old library, it's actually kind of divided up into two sections. The left section uh, had the larger unit, uh, which is the seven and a half ton, which might have been the reason why it hadn't been replaced previous. Um, because the other two systems are fairly new and already on that new refrigerant. Um, so this is the system that failed was on the R22. The new system that is going to be or that was installed today is on the new 410. It's more energy efficient um, and it will provide us with many, many years of service. Okay, and that cost is $13,010. That purchase has already been made, and you are asking to ratify that tonight. Yes, Council, sir. does anybody have any questions? If there are no questions, I'm going to make that consent 11. No objection. Thank you. Excuse sir. me, you said 13010 It says 13000 Yeah, I had to make an adjustment. So Read on the, the actual, motion. Read the motion. Um, I was off by $10. <laughs> The motion has thirteen thousand ten dollars. Yes, so sir. Yep, the headline had thirteen. So yes, sir. Correct My apologies. All right. Thank you. All right. Let's move on to uh, police uh, tab E. Is Mr. Shaddix will be presenting. So E one is purchase active shooter hard plate vest, hard armor plate vest. Go ahead, sir. Yes, sir. This is part of what we've been doing the fundraisers for for the last uh, year and a half, two years. Uh, this is we're finally ready to move forward with these purchases I don't know what questions you might have about it give me just a minute I was gonna pull it up so how much of this uh, did you raise uh, this this the cost here is fifteen thousand two hundred ninety eight dollars and eleven cents is that right yes sir and I believe all of this has been raised through fundraising efforts I thought most of that probably had been I appreciate that okay uh, do you want to talk a little bit about uh, why we would get these? We've, we've done Etheridge, it at a number of. Lieutenant Etheridge would be a better, uh, could probably better explain a lot of it than I could. He's been the. Would you like to star in the show that. for a few minutes tonight, mm -hmm. Lieutenant? We've talked about it a few times at a number of council meetings as we've been raising money and talked about the the concert and those kinds of things. But I think it it, it helps for the public to hear a little bit more about. Sure, absolutely. Afternoon, Mayor and Council. So we began in about October of 2019 with fundraising efforts towards this end. Uh, obviously everyone knows that we wear concealable soft body armor, but that's only designed to defeat certain calibers and types of ammunition. What law enforcement generally has faced an increase of in terms of active shooter events are enhanced weapon capabilities uh, on the other side of the coin, so rifles. So hard armor plate is the way to protect officers who are engaging in an active shooter situation, trying to neutralize that situation or bring it to a um, safe, successful resolution. These vests do that. These are a level 3A, I'm sorry, 3 plus hard armor plate AR-550 steel. They also have a full spall coating. So when a bullet strikes something, it's got to go somewhere, right? Newton taught us that. So what typically will happen is that bullet will fragment into, you go from one large projectile to hundreds of smaller projectiles. It has a coating which will absorb the spall from the uh, round that strikes the plate. The vests that we've selected also come with some enhanced capabilities. They have gear attachments on the front and rear for placing first aid equipment. And they come with integrated tourniquet and magazine pouches also to allow some extra equipment to be available to the officers. They also come with a protective case. Obviously, this is not something that will be worn every day. Uh, we pray that we never need them. <laughs> That's our honest prayer, but we would like to have them should the day come that we need them. So they come with a protective case to allow them to be placed in the patrol vehicle to offer some additional protection to the equipment. They have a 20 year shelf life. Um, three plus is the it's the hard armor to get in our situation. The cost in front of you, a little better than $15,000, that's 100% fundraised. Uh, we have some additional purchases that we'll be presenting to you in the future. We raised enough funds to also purchase helmets and some other accessories. So we are in the quote phase for those items now. I call phase one the vests, and that's where we are today. 
Well, I appreciate that fine forensic analysis. That sounded like you were answering a Jeopardy question there. I'm used to being in court, Mayor. <laughs> <laughs> I thought you did a great job. I didn't know about the helmets, so I appreciate that. Yes, I sir. usually get some sort of a heads up on that. All right, thank you for that, Lieutenant. Uh, does any council members have any questions? I would just give a shout out to Sticks Bar and Grill. I know they were a part of that fundraising. Maybe there were some others too, but I know they did the one downtown and anybody else that donated. And uh, this is good. You guys will have this in your uh, either back seat or in the trunk to pull out if you need it. And hopefully you won't. All right. Anybody else? And I believe at one of our council meetings and certainly at that concert, we actually brought up the lightweight vest and the, these uh, plated, these heavy vest and the, the weight is significant. You're right, you're not wearing it all the time because you couldn't. Uh, you'd look like those guys over there carrying those tires around at the yes, boiler sir. room. <laughs> so, all right, if there are no objections, I will make this uh, consent 12. No objection. no objection. All right, thank you. All right, uh, Mr. Shaddix, Captain, uh, E2, approval of copier maintenance agreement. We're going from something protective to something necessary. We are, as, as we know, we, we make a lot of copies, uh, both for, for building case files to send down to court for prosecutions to uh, copies of reports for citizens, uh, accident reports, so forth. So a copier machine is used daily at, at a great deal. Uh, and I can't tell you how many copies are made. I, I don't have those numbers. But our old copier, it, they've no longer, the company that serviced it will no longer service it because of its age. So we're looking at, at installing this new copier. There's a, um, a contract here. So it's, um, if I believe, I believe it's, oh gosh, I forget what the, the, the amount was. $218 a month for 36 months. There's a $75 origination fee. Uh, anything over 5,000 copies would be charged at 0 .008 cents per copy. Um, but you have no idea how many pages you're running? I'm not sure how many we're running right now, sir. Okay. Well, uh, so my guess is that... I'm, uh, I'm hoping that the 5,000 copies per month would, would keep us close, that we would stay under that. But even if we went over it, it would not, the, the cost would not be that much greater. Okay. Well, I assume that this was... Uh, you, you had uh, looked at multiple offers or uh, bidders for this. My, my understanding, uh, we looked and this was the best that we could find or, or the, what we felt was the best. Yeah, and I've seen agreements like this similar. 5,000 does seem to be a number that they use, but I didn't know how that compares to what the police department uses. I think Alyssa runs 5,000 a week uh, down at City Hall, so I didn't know what you guys yeah. were using. All right, council, does anybody have a question? This amounts to about $7,900 a month. Uh, uh, a year? Well, it's, there's so much per month. There's, uh, it's, it's two hundred eighteen. Yeah, I'm sorry, the total price for 36 months. Yes. Yeah. So it's about $8,000 worth. For a three-year plan. For a three-year plan. That's just the maintenance and it's their equipment. Is that correct? They're going to take care of it. I said that, that, that's, that's the total cost for us for that during that time, other than paper. I was going to say, normally paper is not included. Right. Okay, paper but the toner to and maintenance and all that kind of stuff. Okay. So I, right. I think it's a very good deal. Yeah. It, I, all right, any other questions? All right, if there are no objections, I will make this item C-13. No objections. No objection. All right, thank you, Captain. All right, let's move on to F, utilities. <coughs> Pete, uh, F-1, emergency repair of the North Plant Number 1 aerator gearbox and motor. You always have the most difficult lines for me to read in here. I think you do this on purpose. I do not. I apologize. <laughs> All right, go ahead. I do my best. Um, well, the purpose is to engage a contractor to re rebuild the gearbox and the motor for uh, the aerator at the north plant uh, for the number one basin. Uh, there was a, a bearing failure on the aerator. It's a 1986 model, so it's got a lot of years on it. Uh, this is a budgeted item. Uh, and um, once the bearing failed, we started getting some uh, quite a bit of vibration and then binding up of, of the gears itself, which uh, dictate that we have to go ahead and go through the gearbox. And then when you're doing that work, you also want to do work on the motor. Um, instead of doing one and not the other, you want to do them both at the same time because you have to replace bearings and that sort of thing, inboard and outboard on the motor itself as well. Um, Staff's recommending that we uh, 
engaged Goforth Williamson Incorporated to, to do this rebuild work on the aerator, gearbox, and motor in an amount not to exceed $23,870. All right, you, this starts out by saying emergency repair. Has yes, this repair not been done? It has not been done yet. <laughs> okay, uh, and it is a budgeted item. Did you anticipate uh, this particular repair or was that part of maintenance and repair? It's part generally? of maintenance, it's part of maintenance and repair. That's the line item it's coming out of. Yes, sir. Okay, council, does anybody have any questions? All right, if there are no questions, I'll make this consent 14. No objection. Thank you, Pete. Thank you. All right, Mr. Tom Barber, we will get to uh, tab G, city manager, item number one, professional services agreement with Michael Bledsoe. I guess he's with the engineering group. Yeah, Michael is an independent engineer, uh, been, in, been on his own for about 20 years, and the way that I met him was through Brennan. Uh, we've had a relationship with Brennan now for a couple of years. He's if you remember, he started out, I guess, with the, the lift station analysis, and then he did the manhole review and has helped us with uh, the whole idea of doing basin level sewer improvements instead of for each individual development. Um, the problem with Brennan is it's just Brennan. So we're using Carter and Sloop for the bigger projects like Edge Road and 78 and North Avenue and Cowan Lake and the water plant. But on the sewer side, we're using just Brennan and he just can't keep up. So if you remember when we did the lift station analysis, we still have not bid that. So was that 18 and 19? And then we did the manhole analysis and it has not been bid out. And right now, we've got more development going on than we can keep up with because of the sewer implications of all of them, particularly developments like the townhomes beside First Baptist or the residential development on Connors across the street from Liberty Point. So I went to Brennan one day and I said, Brennan, I need a clone. Go find a guy like you with your background that's been working with municipalities who can come in here and help us on smaller projects and actually do what you're doing. And so this is who he recommended. We had Mike come in, very sort of eerily similar background. Uh, Southern Tech guy, around the same age, been in business for himself around the same time, worked in lots of cities that we know. Uh, one of the benefits of using Brennan that we don't have with Mike is that Brennan is in, lives in Winston, and Mike lives in Gwinnett, which is not ideal. But a lot of what he'll be doing for us is design, and so he can do that wherever. So I'm recommending that we give Mike a try. I don't have any experience with him from previous employment, but um, comes highly recommended, has a background that seems to fit us in terms of municipal design, and I think he'll help us to get some of these projects completed and help us stay up with the development that we see coming our way. All right. Uh, council, does anybody have any questions for Tom? Yeah, Mr. Carter. Uh, he's quoting it by the hour. Any idea how many hours we're talking about here? You hundred fifty dollars, hundred and fifty dollars an hour for a project manager. It it'll be the same way that we handle Brennan. So I think Brennan is probably five dollars an hour more than how many hours we talking this about this rate. Well, what we do with Brennan is we bring you every project with a not to exceed, and we'll do the same thing with Mike. So you know we'll. We'll say, hey, this is the project. Give me a proposal. We bring it to y'all. Y'all approve it. We do. It'll be task by task as we go. Oh, okay. Our best hope is that we have two Brennans. Go ahead, Mr. Carter. Yep. No. Yep. Okay. If they're going to do it project by project, we'll know the total cost. Yes, sir, on each one. Right. Uh, any other council members? All right. If there are no objections, I'll make this item C-15. Uh, no objection. Thank you. All right, let's move to G2, 
to uh, general election 2021 qualifying fees. As we all are aware, there will be an, a, a municipal election this year. There'll be three council member seats up. These, Mr. Macklin, these fees are set by law. They are a percentage. 3% uh, of your salary. So there, there's not a lot of discussion here. Uh, council, do you have any questions? He just answered mine where the number came from. It's 3%, okay. All right. If there are no further questions and no objections, I'll make this item consent 16. No objection. No objection. Thank you, sir. All right, let's get to G3, uh, which I must say uh, I have not had a chance to get briefed on, so I'm going to be learning on this item. All right. All right, let me read it. G3, approval of resolution to purchase <laughs> lot 11 in Tanyard Village. So back in... 18 or so we started talking about the issue of <coughs> the sewer line under 20 and the bottleneck that that presented and that sewer line runs up the east side of 61 through multiple lift stations up to walmart and then goes through an eight inch underneath the interstate and then follows a single route through the Ingalls development and the Food Depot development to Centennial Park across the street from City Hall and then goes beside City Hall. And the solution that we proposed, or at least the Band-Aid, was to put in a relief line from the first manhole north of 20 that, that directs flow over to Ingalls and the hotels that we would put in another line that would go due north and run along the other side of Tanyard, sort of between Tanyard and Powell Park down to the same point at Bicentennial. So basically all we did was move the bottleneck to Bicentennial from just north of 20, but it bought us all that capacity so we've got that much pipe that can fill up now twice instead of once before we have a backup so we got that done now the problem is having done that we realize that we can't get back there and maintain anything there's we own land we the city between powell park and the backyards of the houses on the east side of tanyard but it's not passable which is why it's still undeveloped. It's a long, narrow, north-south parcel. So we went to Larry Boggs, who is developing the remaining houses on the end of Tanyard, and asked him about doing some kind of acquisition of one of those parcels so we could build a road to get back in there and maintain this sewer easement. Well, he has had to place a $50,000 bond to have the roads resurfaced in there when he finishes building. And so what he proposed was is that we release that bond and we take on the responsibility of doing the road and in return he gives us the deed for that for one of those lots, which we, we felt like was a fair trade. So we added that road work, right, to this to the current Baldwin project, which would be done <laughs> next year. And uh, we're still going to have to incur the cost of building a gravel road, right? So we'll have to clear and maybe grade some and, you know, put in a road to get back there. But that's our solution to, to the access issue. Well, I take that back. Uh, I was not briefed on it uh, for this agenda, but I've been well briefed on it many times uh, over probably the last eight months and I am aware of the issue. Let me ask a question though. Uh, let me make sure I understand. So if we release the $50,000 bond, uh, have we considered, Mr. Macklin, I guess, uh, what the value of this uh, lot 11 is and what the city would be paying in comparison to that value? I, I don't know the answer to that. I have not done that. Are, aren't we required to get an appraisal before we enter in a, into an agreement to buy real property? It's advisable to do so. I don't think that it's an absolute legal requirement. 
Um, what do you estimate the, the cost is to the city for lot 11? So, so what, where Bobby comes into this is he did the, um, the paving part of this and Bobby, tell them what do you think the cost of the actual paving component of our side of the transaction is? We, we can't, we, don't, we won't know exactly until the actual work's done because, you know, you field quantities are, are how you, or how the paving company actually builds us for that particular thing. But the engineer's estimate that I've got based on the current paving prices per ton is about 40 grand is what it's going to cost to retop those streets in Old Tanger Village. So if he has a $50,000 bond, he would have used 40 of that 50,000 based on Bobby's estimate. Uh, and if we release the 50, then essentially we're paying $40,000 for, for lot that 11. Lot. Mm -hmm. And we absolutely need this access. I have been in a number of meetings where staff just cannot get back there. So, all right, I understand it better now and I appreciate that. Council, do you have any questions? You said 40000 but we were released a $50,000 bond. Well, the $50,000 bond is what the developer has put up to guarantee that he will top the road. Yeah. He may not spend 50, he may only spend 30 or 40 or 20. Bobby estimates that it would cost 40, so we assume Mr. that that's Mayor, we, our we cost. Mr. Mayor, yes, we, we got some great per ton prices based on a $2 million paving project. Yes, sir. That's uh, what I doubt paying. seriously whether Mr. Boggs could get that subdivision topped for less than 50. Okay, all right. Uh, yes, sir, Mr. Young. I, I missed the piece about whether or not we were required to get an appraisal. He said it's advisable, mm -hmm. not required. That's correct. I just note that the uh, Carroll County tax records show the value at $10,000, and I think the neighboring lot's $20,000, so. Uh, I understand that Mr. Boggs may have some lost profits to factor into that, so. However, but I in our, to point in that our out. case, I don't have a plan B. Yeah, I mean, I, I figured that's where we were going with that, number yeah, one. Man. And number two, I mean, Mr. Mecklen, would you like to talk about tax value versus uh, actual value? Hey, let, let's, let's not forget, and from a real estate perspective, these lots are developed lots, which you probably cannot get for less than thirty-five dollars or $40,000 right now. Yeah. I so, I mean, there is, there, there is certainly reason to believe that the value is there if somebody weren't going to build a house. The problem the city has is we don't have access to our facilities unless we get access here. And I don't know that we would have a plan B in terms of an easement if they did build a house there. There's usually a premium that goes along to the buyer who really, really needs that one particular lot. Mm -hmm as opposed to any other lot out of the market? It feels like more than I would want to pay. It feels like in our situation we don't have a choice and that it is still a fair deal to me. Uh, this is a cul-de-sac lot. Are we going to be responsible for maintaining any aesthetics or anything? Just like we would. We have gravel drives into well, uh, cutting the lot maintaining uh, the yeah, grass because we're right in the middle of a subdivision with, with all of our list stations i mean where's pete how, how many driveways into <coughs> list stations through neighborhoods do we have off the top of my head i can't answer that but we've got a, a dozen at least a dozen yeah so i mean it's it, it's not new but i will say in all fairness to the comments, I'm not proposing this because this is a, a good land transaction for us. This is not buying a lot and flipping it or, you know, oh, this is a great deal. I need access to that sewer line bad. And if I have a backup, and this is, this is the bottleneck of the system, and I can't get to it. Major problems major cost. I have no practical alternative, right? I mean, I, there's just no way to get to this thing. And whoever, whoever laid it initially should have resolved this, right, when we put the line in that runs, you know, par almost parallel to 20 from the manhole over toward the hotel. So go, Pete. Well, one thing I wanted to add to that is we're not just trying to maintain 
right away, so to speak. It's, it's imp- imperative that we get access to, the, to that particular manhole where that eight inch line goes under the interstate. And in order to clean that properly, you have to use the largest vacuum truck that they've got out there, which is tremendously big and heavy. And therefore, when Tom said we have to build a road even from the cul-de-sac to get up to the manhole, that's what it requires so the truck doesn't bog down and get stuck. But uh, that's a critical access point for the city from the, from the south to the north of all the wastewater flow that's coming this way. So that's why it's that important. I appreciate those comments. I, it, it weighs on me even more now as I recall the, the, the numerous meetings I've been in over getting back there. And I, you know, hindsight's twenty twenty. but you, if you'd have started your uh, presentation how you just finished it, which was I'm not presenting this to you as a good real estate transaction. I think we could have got uh, past some of the initial jitters that some of us had. All right, Council, any other questions? Just one question. Yes, you sir, said go we've got to build a road. What's it going to cost us to put a road in? You want to take a shot at that? You're talking about a lot of loads of gravel, whatever it is. Yeah, it's not really a road. It's a, it's a uh, stout driveway to get a truck up. Um, probably five grand. No more than that. Oh, okay. But you'll bring that to us separately, Bobby. Can you we, use? We, can, we yes. can tell you. Yeah. Yeah. Right. Can you use the asphalt shavings? Your yes. Stop piling. Yes. <laughs> yes. <laughs> you, Don't you, say you that Melorica doesn't you recycle. Read our minds. <laughs> we we've been trying to use the mailings every time we have an opportunity. I was going to say that is actually going on regularly. We are finding way. We don't always come out here and talk about you know, all those things that are going on, but we are finding other ways to save money. No, that's, I think sometimes people don't good. think that's what we're doing, but that we obviously are doing that. It's a lot better than dumping it somewhere. So when we're recycling, just like they're using tires for rubber things on the playground, I love to hear it when we can use that and not dump it somewhere. All right, if there are no objections, I'm gonna make this consent number 17. All right, no we're gonna move on now to uh, public comments. Are there, Thank you, ma'am. Uh, so I'm going to uh, ask you to uh, please keep your comments on a professional level. Are there people here who will give comment? Okay, there will be. We will not accept comments that are considered by the chair to be of a personal attack on any individual or group of individuals. If you deviate from this protocol, you'll receive a warning. If you do it again, you're going to be asked to leave. Only one person speak at a time and no comments from the audience. Uh, Mr. Jeff Matthews, will you be speaking? Thank you, sir. <laughs> uh, Ms. Jody Mount, come forward. We'll give you three minutes to speak. Jody Mount, 214 Rock Martin Road here in Villa Rica. And um, I just want to kind of give a little history lesson. Historically, Villarica has kicked the can down the road. So I really appreciate the fact that a lot of these costs that we're having to deal with and problems are, are from that. And one of the reasons they've kicked the, well, I don't know why. I don't, I don't know why, to get reelected. Um, but historically, we have not held developers accountable for their work. We act, our, when I say we, I'm talking about elected officials, appointed officials, and city staff have acted like developers are doing us a favor by coming here and doing things. No, we are doing them a favor by allowing them to come here to Villarica. We've got location, location, location. And they need to follow the ordinances. We don't need to bend over backwards to give them deals. Um, you know, and, and I'm, I'm, ha I'm really, really, really struggling with what in the What's the point of a tree ordinance when anything, oh, well, the grading, we can take them out. Popeyes, no, no sidewalk. The new Bain building, I see no evidence of a sidewalk going in there. Oh, well, there's one across the street. Well, let me tell you, when you're coming down the road from downtown and you have to walk over on this side and you want to go to SunTrust, you have to walk all the way up to get to a safe crossing to go over to SunTrust or Susie's Wings or anything else that's back there. 
You know, it's not say we say we're going to have we want to be a walkable community. It makes economic sense. It makes safety sense. We need if we have any things, sidewalks, trees, we need we need to keep them, you guys. You know, so I, I just really want you to remember how we got to where we are while we're dealing with some of these problems we're dealing with, like at the Avante building and the sewer situation. And we have these ordinances for a reason. You know, let's let's enforce them, please. Thank you. Thank you, ma'am. Uh, is there anyone else here? I've, I have no more on my list. All right, see you no more. I will close public comments uh, and I will ask Bobby one question. I did the, the groundbreaking for the Bain building and I saw the rendering there. I don't recall if I saw sidewalks in front of the Bain building on that rendering. You saw sidewalk, yes, sir. Sidewalk will be poured in the last, absolute last phase of that development. You don't pour a sidewalk during construction because you end up keep repouring it. Totally good. I just wanted that yes. to be said. Yes, it is required and it is, it has been, yes. Thank will, you, Bobby. It will be there. All right. Um, so let's start to, to clean up this agenda, which is a mess. Mm. Uh, there's probably a few things that I, I'm going to miss, so y'all just be patient and then I'll let you correct me at the end. I want to first just call out the consent agenda, but I know there's also some cleanup on a few items. So uh, consent item number one will be appointment of William D. Coleman, Jr. to the Villarica Development Authority. Consent number two would be the appointment of David Rogers to the Historic Preservation Commission. Consent number three, appointment of Sarah Pitts to the Historic Preservation Commission. Consent number four, appointment of Alan White to Historic Preservation Commission. Consent number five, appointment of Renee Hooks to Historic Preservation Commission. Consent number six, appointment of Mac Pilgrim to Planning and Zoning Commission. Consent number seven, appointment of Tom Flowers to Planning and Zoning Commission. Consent number eight, appointment of John Hannaback to the Planning and Zoning Commission. Consent number nine is the splash pad equipment purchase. Consent number 10, Avanti slash Welcome Center plumbing repair. Consent number 11, to engage KBS heating and cooling to replace a seven and a half ton unit located at 70 Horace Luther Drive, Villarica, Georgia. Uh, consent number 12, purchase active shooter hard armor plate vests. Consent number 13, approval of copier maintenance agreement with the police department. Let's add that to the end of that item, police department. Consent number 14, emergency repair of the North Plant number one aerator gearbox and motor. Consent number 15, prof professional services agreement with Michael Bledsoe and the engineering group. Consent number 16, general election 2021 qualifying fees. Consent number 17 is the approval of the resolution to purchase lot 11 in Tanyard Village. Does anybody see anything different on the consent agenda? Okay. Uh, item number B7 on the uh, council work session agenda, uh, I will ask that uh, some council member uh, make a motion to table that when we get to it in the regular session. And items number eight and nine, um, no, item number uh, B8, I will ask for an amendment to the motion to strike pages 14 and 15. And items uh, B9 and 10, uh, these items need to be tabled to the next uh, council meeting. Does anybody see any changes that I've missed or any cleanup that we need to do? Yes, sir, Mr. Tar Barber. Tell me what we're doing with eight again. Uh, I thought we were pushing all three of those. So we're going to, uh, <laughs> my understanding is, it's an adoption of a supplement you need to turn your mic on. Mic. It's an adoption of a supplement, not an amendment to the zoning order, so it doesn't require a public hearing. So we're going to approve all of it except pages 14 and 15. No, I, mean, I don't buy that. I, I, don't, no. I don't think that it makes much sense to, to I mean, if it's a change, if it's going to be some, it's not an official change, but it is a supplement, I think they ought to have the public hearing on that also. 
Okay, that's a different opinion than what we got a little earlier. So, okay. but well, that's okay. I, I, so I, we will we will do that. Yeah, so I, I just think it makes sense too. Right. Maybe you could get by without doing it, but I think you you raise questions if you didn't have a public hearing on it. Well, then we'll do that. Let's we'll table that item opinion. as well. <laughs> okay. Yes, sir. Yeah, I was going to suggest we table that. We'll table that item as well. Okay. Good. And then when we do bring it back with the public hearing, we will agree to uh, amend it. Yes, ma'am. Seven through ten. Eight, nine, and ten. Seven, oh, eight, seven, eight, nine, nine ten. Yeah. Seven, ten. Eight, nine, ten. Seven. All right. I told y'all it was a mess. It was going to take us a minute. All right. Does anybody see anything different? All right. Mr. Mecklin, do you have anything to add? I do not. Uh, Mr. Barber. All right. Any members of council have anything to add? If not, we will be adjourned.